Greetings AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here. We're going to talk about our example 6 from topic 6.3. It's called the limit process and we're going to really focus on the math that's used in order to evaluate the limit of a summation. And as I've warned you before, there's quite a bit of steps to these problems. I promise you it'll contain algebra that you've already learned or just recently discussed and reviewed in my previous videos, but some of the problems might take anywhere from 7 to 12 steps, so you'll want to brace yourself for that, but I promise you that it's going to really shed some light on a really important concept of calculus coming up here very, very soon. So let's take a look at simplifying the limit of a summation. So here we go. We have a limit problem as n approaches infinity of the summation as i goes from 1 to n of the quantity 1 plus 2i over n squared times 2 over n. Now if you remember, we did a problem very similar to this in example 5. I uh, gave it a little bit of context and then we kind of saw this limit of a summation come out of nowhere. So this isn't really the first time that you've seen this and it's really important that you practice it a few times before uh, you start to judge whether or not you're pretty efficient with it because like I said it's got quite a few steps to it. So here is what my belief is in, in how you can make these problems a little bit easier for you. I always look at the part of the summation expression that might have some exponent around it because that's where you're going to be working the hardest. And it turns out that you are going to have to foil out this 1 plus 2i over n and that's no fun but it can probably be made a little bit easier if we get a common denominator. So I'm always going to encourage that. I'm also going to tell you that you're going to wish that you had a stamp that would just plop down a limit as n approaches infinity or a summation as i goes from 1 to n because you're going to have to replicate those many times. Don't be lazy. Make sure you write them with each step. And so Here's what our common denominator would look like. I know it doesn't seem like we did a whole lot with that step, but trust me when I say things are going to be a little bit easier. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and think about this n being squared and this 2 over n multiplying by that n squared in the bottom. And essentially, I have a 2 over n cubed. I am going to take that 2 over n cubed and bring it out in front of the summation. But note, I will not bring it out in front of the limit. And the reason that I'm bringing it out in front of the summation is because the summation only affects things that have i's in them, and the limit will certainly affect things that have n's in them. So he's got to at least stay here so that the limit can do his job upon him. Now, as far as this n plus 2i quantity squared is concerned, if you feel the need that you need to write out a pair of those somewhere off to the side so that you can draw your arrows and perform your foil and whatnot, that's perfectly fine you're going to end up with the quantity n squared plus 4in or 4ni, it doesn't matter to me, plus 4i squared at the end. So we're two steps in. We've just basically done some uh, multiplying, some squaring, some factoring, and some multiplying. The next thing that we're going to do is probably the the um, most important step, it's also maybe one of the more trickier steps, and that is to use your summation properties. So the limit and the 2 over n cubed is going to plop down in front. But at this stage, we are going to then essentially apply the summation to each one of these individually. It's like distributing the summation. And we have to remember that if you take the summation of something that's basically a constant, n squared is a constant. It really is as far as the letter i is concerned. And so if you remember, if you take the summation of c from 1 to n, the answer was c times n. It's just that now our c is n squared. So if we take n squared times n, we get n to the third. All right? Basically, you're just taking n squared plus n squared plus n squared in different times, and that would be n squared times n. Next up, we're going to see that the 4 times n can factor out in front, 
and then we just basically take the summation of i and if you remember that guy that's the little uh, formula that the little five six-year-old carl friedrich gauss stumbled upon as the as the uh, rumor goes and it would be n times n plus one all over two now remember that the four n is coming from these two pieces the i's turns the summation of the i rather turns into the n in plus one over two and then we have one more where the four is going to come out in front and then we have to think about the summation of i squared if you have to flip back through your notes that's okay this is a very tricky one to memorize i get that n times n plus one all over two n plus one uh, let's say that again n times n plus one times two n plus one all over six that would be the result all right, we're really doing a good job here. You're at a stage now where if you can find the answer to the limit, you're all good to go. Well, I don't know if you're really quite comfortable to find the answer to this limit yet. I really advocate the fact that you probably would like to get a common denominator first. And I know that you could reduce the four and the two and the four and the six, and you're welcome to do that. The other option is if you wanna just look at these denominators as staying the way that they are, 1, 2, and 6, you could go ahead and apply a common denominator of 6 right now. It's really up to you. If you don't simplify now, you can always simplify later. So if we want a common denominator of 6, what really does that mean? Well, it means we get a denominator of 6. Well, this n cubed is going to have to multiply by a 6 because the 1 multiplied by a 6. So that is done. Okay, now this 2, in order for him to become this 6, we had to multiply him by a 3. We'll do the same thing on top. And then, you know, I'm going to go ahead and multiply those two n's just to get an n squared like that. And then lastly, to make this 6 a 6, well, it's already a 6. We can just basically replicate what was in the numerator. All right, we're doing great, you guys. We're almost there. Now, how simplified do you need to make this in order to find the limit? That's a great question because that is entirely up to you. What we do know about the limit of functions where n approaches infinity is that if you can compare the degree of n on top and the degree of n on bottom, and by degree, I mean the highest power of n you're going to see, if those two things happen to be the same, then you just divide the coefficient of that n to the power term. And I'm here to tell you that if the degree of the n's are not the same on the top and the bottom, we have made a mistake because these limits actually depict a very important concept of area and these areas under these curves that we've been studying do indeed exist. You can see the shaded region and you can therefore compute it. So all I need you to do is just tell me what do you think the highest power of n is going to be on both the numerator and denominator? Well, how about we take a look at the denominator? <laughs> because that's pretty darn obvious, isn't it? There's no doubt that this denominator is going to consist of 6n cubed eventually. We know that. Now the key is to figure out what is going to be the coefficient of the n cubed on top. So what I would suggest is we could distribute this 2, 2 times 6, which is 12, n cubed and so we know so far we have 12 n cubed and if we keep doing that plus the 2 is going to distribute to this 12 therefore we have 24 that n squared and that n are going to multiply to get n cubed and then here is the part that I don't really care if you want to take a little bit of liberty to kind of overlook I know and maybe you do it as well that this 12 n squared is going to distribute to this 1, and I'm going to get a 12n squared times the 2, which is 24n squared. But as you'll note, I wrote that in gray because we don't really need to consider it since he's not going to be a term with a, t a power of, of 3 attached to the end. That's going to mean that you do not have to foil out or expand this pair of binomials. Instead, you just have to focus on what do I get if I take the 4n times the n times the 2n, because those three pieces are going to make an n cubed term. 8n cubed, in fact. Don't forget the 2s in front. 
So I would really have a 16n cubed. And to be honest, I know that I'm going to probably get some n squared term. I'm going to probably get some n to the first term. I don't know what the coefficients are. And I'm probably going to get some constant term. But to be honest, again, they don't have any type of connection to our final answer. Because our final answer is just going to be a matter of us taking all of these coefficients in the numerator of n cubed and adding them together. 24 and 16 is 40 plus the 12 is 52. And then divide that by the coefficient of the n that's in the bottom, of the n cubed rather, that's in the bottom 6. And boom, there's your answer. Now note, you can reduce this to 26 thirds if you'd like. And that would be the answer to this limit. The big question is, what does this mean? We're kind of still getting into that process and slowly revealing that. But you really want to get very comfortable at working through some of these algebraic processes. I said these problems take anywhere from 7 to 12 steps. You might look at this and say, hey, we did this one about 5 or 6. But keep in mind, I did consolidate a few steps for you along the way. Those of you that are in my class, you have access to the full solution key um, on Schoology. And you'll notice that I broke it down into many more steps so that you could follow it a little easier. Hope this helps. We'll see you at the next video.